Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like you to turn, please, to the book of Judges once more. We're in chapter 5. Judges chapter 5, we're <clears throat> down in verse 23. I'd like to read from verse 23 into chapter 6, down to verse 6. And we're going to really continue this theme, and uh, this morning's title will be Ruin and Recovery. Ruin and Recovery. So uh, verse uh, 23, it says, Curse ye miros." said the angel of the Lord, curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to help up to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. He asked water and she gave him milk, she brought forth butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer, she smote Sisera. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stricken through temples. At her feet, he bowed. He fell. He lay down at her feet. He bowed. He fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. The mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice, Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariots? Her wise ladies answered her, yea, she returned answer to herself. Have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey to every man a damsel or two? To Sisera, a prey of diverse colors, a prey of diverse colors of needlework, of diverse colors of needlework on both sides. Meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. So let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. And the land had rest forty years. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. And they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. For they came up <clears throat> with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And again, God will bless the reading of his precious word uh, to us this morning. So we begin this little section with, uh, and again, remember, this is the, the song of Deborah and Barak. And so it's a poetic, as it were, rehashing of the battle. And what we saw was that, uh, that the battle had been won ultimately uh, by Barak when he trusted the Lord and, and went against these chariots. The Lord sent this tremendous storm, and then ultimately uh, Sisera fled, and he comes to the tent of Heber, and uh, particularly Jael, his wife, and goes into the tent, and of course she puts an end to this enemy of Israel. But I want you to notice that verse 23 and 24, we've got a cursing and we have a blessing. Uh, curse ye miros, verse 23, and, and curse is mentioned, uh, repeated there. Uh, <clears throat> curse ye bitterly, the inhabitants thereof. So you've got double curse here on miros. And then in verse 24, you have a double blessing on jail. Blessed above women shall jail the wife of Heber that cannot be. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. So basically, it, we're, we're kind of evaluating what people did in the day of battle. And Miraz is cursed, doubly cursed, 
because of their failure to come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty, it says, the end of verse 23. And of course, it's theologically very interesting, isn't it? Uh, I mean, does God really need help? <laughs> I mean, isn't God able to defeat uh, Sisera and all of his chariots and all of his men easily? Of course he is. Uh, he, he doesn't need the help of man, but he wants the help of man. Uh, he wants us to be co-laborers together with him. And so he was an opportunity. And uh, from what I understand, Miraz was in a place of particular strategic location that could have cut off the retreat of Sisera and his forces. And uh, sadly, they were so indifferent. Uh, they just didn't lift a finger. And so they didn't get involved. They didn't come to the help of the Lord. Uh, not that he needed it, but he wanted them to be participants. And because of their failure, because of their apathy, because of their unwillingness, even though they were so strategically located, a curse is pronounced upon them because of their failure to be involved in the battle at a crucial moment and a crucial time. On the other hand, as we said uh, this lady, Jael, uh, she took the opportunity that presented itself to her, and she allowed the Lord to use her and is doubly blessed. And again, just as a simple principle that we need to learn is there's always blessing when we get involved in the Lord's things. We're blessed. We're doubly blessed. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I, as I read uh, the writings of the Apostle Paul, it always amazes me that he just thought it was a marvelous thing that not only would God save him, but he actually wanted him on his team. And it just, it, it, he never lost the wonder of that, 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 he, he, that he, he wanted him to serve. And I think for us, it's, it's an amazing thing. The Lord wants to use us. He wants to, he, he delights to use us, the weak and foolish things for all of our inadequacies. He says, you come and serve. And, and there's a delight in that. And, and there's a blessing in that. And we see the Lord work. We see his hand at work when we put ourselves in that place. And so Mira's failed miserably to take their opportunity for service and were cursed. Now, I want you just to look at a couple of passages that are uh, of, of significance in, in terms of this. What happens when people fail to get involved in the battle? And I want you to look at Judges 8. We're jumping ahead, but I just want you to see that this what this idea of this cursing looked like. And so in Judges 8, verse 15 through 17, we read this, and he came unto the men of Succoth and said, Behold, Zeba and Zalmunna, with whom ye did upbraid me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thy men that are weary? So the context here is that the, uh, the, the servants of Gideon were weary in pursuing after the enemy, and the people of Succoth could have helped them just by giving them some food. And because they, the, in their minds, the, the end result of the battle was uncertain. And so they didn't want to, as it were, be helping uh, potentially uh, uh, causing the enemy to come and chastise them. They, they didn't get involved. And so <clears throat> he says in verse 16, he took the elder of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Succoth. So he gave them a, a lesson, uh, and uh, basically used thorns of the wilderness and briars, and I suspect gave them a good beating, it says, and he beat down the power of Penwell and slew the men of the city. So there we go, there because they failed to get involved and help in the battle. Look at Judges 21. Judges 21. We we'll see a very similar pattern in Judges 21 and verses 8 through 10. And they said, what one is there of the tribes of Israel that came not up to Mizpah to the Lord? And behold, they came none to the camp from Jabesh Gilead, Gilead to the assembly, for the people were numbered, 
And behold, there were none of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead there. And the congregation sent there the 12,000 men of the valiantists and commanded them, saying, Go and smite the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, with the women and the children. And so what we see is a, is a consistent pattern here in the book of Judges, that those that could have been involved but were indifferent and chose not to be involved, each of them received direct punishment because of their failure to be involved in the battle and came under a curse. And so it's just, it's very significant, isn't it, to think about this because uh, we're involved in the conflict of the ages. We really are. And it's a serious thing to be indifferent in a day of battle. It's a very serious thing. And we, of course, we're not going to be cursed. I don't believe that's going to happen. But we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we'll give an account. And we'll, we'll answer to the Lord, how, how come with the needs that were there so real before us, uh, we didn't even lift a finger? And I think there'll be a great sense of shame that we could have been more involved and we weren't. And we missed our opportunity. This is our day. This is our opportunity to get involved uh, in the battles of the Lord. And we need to do that. And, and we're missing out on a blessing. Not only will we be reproached when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, but we're going to miss out on a blessing. And here we see in contrast, blessed above women shall jail the wife of Heba the Kenite be, blessed shall she be uh, above women in the tent. And, and so uh, Lord deliver us from being pathetically indifferent in the face of a dying world. Stir us to be involved in the conflict of the ages. Uh, take us out of our lethargy. Let's get involved. And also just uh, this, in sharp contrast, this blessing. Uh, and of course, we, what we find is that Miraz is never heard of again in scripture. Just done. You never hear it again. It lost its opportunity. But here's a woman and she's blessed above women, jail, the wife of Heba, the Kenite, uh, because they were indifferent, but she was engaged. <laughs> uh, she uh, saw the opportunity, uh, and so she took it gloriously. And it tells us, uh, he, of course, this uh, uh, leader, um, the, the captain of the host, shows up at her door, and uh, it says in verse 25, he asked water, she gave him milk, she brought forth butter in a lordly dish. And as we said last time, you know, she gave him a bowl of ice cream and uh, kind of got him to settle down, put a blanket on him. And then it says, she put her hand to the nail and her right hand to the workman's hammer. And with the hammer, she smote scissor. She smote off his head when she had pierced and stripped through his temples. And so uh, she had a very pointed message for this man, Sisera. Remember when we were looking at it previously, we said that, that this, this invasion of Jabin and his forces, captained by Sisera, Jabin means intelligence or worldly wisdom. And we said the practical application, a very practical application for us, as we're constantly bombarded by worldly wisdom, is to take... The, the hammer, which is symbolic from Jeremiah of the word of God, and pound it home into our thick skulls, <laughs> uh, basically. And it's the only way that we will be able to enjoy victory over the worldly wisdom that prevails, pounding in the word of God into, into our thick skulls. Anyway, she certainly did that. And notice uh, she uh, she took it in her right hand. It's just kind of interesting because we've just recently dealt with a man who was left-handed. And of course, right hand is the symbol of strength. And of course, it's always considered weakness, the left hand. 
Uh, but it says she put her hand to the nail, her right hand to the workman's hammer. Okay, and so it's a, a symbol of strength. And it's often a symbol of God's strength. You know, here's this woman, but she's up against this this captain of a host. But she allows God's strength to flow through her, and she's able, as it were, to defeat this enemy. And so she allowed His strength to work through her, and the the enemy's humiliation was total and complete. And so it says <clears throat> that um, verse 27, at her feet, he bowed, he fell, he lay down at her feet, he bowed, he fell, where he bowed there, he fell down dead. Thus endeth Sisera, who symbolizes for us worldly wisdom. It was brought to a very humiliating end. But then the scene immediately switches. And, and again, remember, this is poetry, but it's marvelous poetry and so the scene from jail's tent to the luxurious home of Sisera where his mother another woman is waiting for the victor she thinks to come home and so the mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice so no pilgrim tent here this is a nice house with a lattice windows, all the rest of it. And the mother of Sisera, looking out at a window, cried through the lattice, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why tarry the wheels of his chariot? In other words, why is he delayed? I mean, he should be back from that by now. He should be home from the battle. So there's this agonizing waiting uh, for, for him to come back. And then, of course, she's given some advice and some comfort her wise ladies answered her, yea, she returned uh, answering to herself. And she, you know, she takes their advice and she speaks to herself about it. And she basically was saying is, oh, yeah, he's, he's, he's gathering up the plunder and uh, he's, he's gathering all the spoils of war. And he's going to come back with all these treasures. Uh, have they not sped? Have they not divided the prey for every man a damsel or two? To Sisera, a prey of diverse colors, prey of diverse colors of needlework, diverse colors of needlework on both sides, meet for the necks of them that take the spoil. So just a couple of thoughts here. First of all, what it does tell us is that part of this dominion of the Canaanites over Israel included the idea of women basically being taken off and the usual thing, rape and pillage and all of the, the things that we think of uh, in those kind of circumstances. And actually, uh, you, won't, you don't necessarily see it here uh, in English, but in the Hebrew text, uh, the, the language of the word damsel uh, is a word that's usually used for womb. And so it, it, it literally has the idea of they were taking for lustful purposes, and uh, <laughs> it's suggesting uh, that that was their intent. And so, again, we just see something of the morality. Here's the mother of this man, and she's just like his rival because basically he's taking the spoil of these lustful women. Again, it shows that there was absolutely no morality whatsoever in the Canaanite ranks. That's why God wanted them wiped out because they were so utterly wicked. And, and so she is, you know, well, he's, uh, she comforts herself. Uh, he's taking some women and, and then he's coming back with uh, these beautiful trophies of victory, uh, coming back and bringing with her uh, the treasures of the beautiful garments, you know, godly, uh, uh, worldly uh, garments uh, that uh, will be a, a treasure. And so this is the, the scene that's given to us. And then we read uh, again, Deborah's last words here. So let all thine enemies perish. That would be her cry. That just as the way the Lord has brought amazing victory over Sisera and his 900 chariots and over this Canaanite invasion that had so impoverished the people of, of God, the cry of Deborah is, so let all thine enemies perish. Let them all be humiliated. Let them all be uh, at the feet, as it were, of jail, <laughs> uh, be brought to that humiliating place. And of course, we recognize that there's a day coming when all the enemies of God 
are going to be brought to the feet, not of jail, but they're going to be brought to the feet of the Lord Jesus. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That day is coming. Let all the enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he goeth forth in his might. In other words, those that love him are to be radiant. His enemies are to be humbled, brought low, brought at his feet, but those that love him to shine forth as the radiance of the sun when he goeth forth in his might, the full uh, shining glory of the sun in all of its might should be seen, uh, reflected on the faces of those that love the Lord. And the land had rest for 40 years. And so a great victory given into the hands of a woman, remember, because Barak wanted a woman to hold his hand initially to go into battle. He said, it won't be for your honor. And of course, it's jail that gets the blessed uh, accolation. But the ungodly have always spent their lives looking out of the window of man's wisdom, hoping for the best, that all will turn out well. And the only thing that they can expect is disappointment and destruction because worldly wisdom has no help for anyone. It's only to be found in the wisdom of God that's found in the word of God and the person of the Lord Jesus. And so we move on to chapter six. And this is chapter, this section uh, deals with Gideon, the call and character of Gideon. And this is the fourth cycle mentioned in the book of Judges. Remember, we said that you got these cycles of, of, of their sin and their servitude, and then their supplication when they call out to the Lord, and then the salvation when he raises up a deliverer. And this is cycle number four. And it's obviously very important because there's more sp space in terms of the text of scripture devoted to Gideon than any other judge. There are 100 verses that are going to be dealing with the life of Gideon. The next longest judge in terms of amount of text is Samson, and he manages 96 verses. So he's close, but Gideon gets more attention than anyone else. So clearly the story of Gideon is very important. Samuel Rideout or Rideau, I don't know quite how you pronounce his name, but very interesting Bible commentator. He said, Gideon's story contains the secret of recovery and of divine power in days of universal ruin through an instrument that is feeble enough. Let me read that again. I think it's a great statement and very encouraging to us. Gideon's story contains the secret of recovery and of divine power in days of universal ruin through an instrument that is feeble enough. And I want to just think about that for a moment because I think that's why this lesson is so important because I think we would say that we're living in days that could be described as days of universal ruin. There's departure, uh, there's decline, uh, you know, these, these are tough days and we can see it. And yet, is it possible that we might see a recovery? Well, Gideon would say, yes, there is possibility of recovery and of divine power. And I think if, if there's anything we need today, it's recovery and divine power in this day of ruin. <laughs> and, and again, it's through a, an instrument that is feeble enough. And of course, that's all we've got to offer, right? Ourselves, and we're pretty feeble. And yet there's hope in the story of Gideon. And so I'm going to give you kind of the, the outline of how we're going to deal with chapter six. So in verses one through six, we're going to look at the condition of the people. Okay, so we're going to just, what happened after the land had rest for 40 years to bring them back into this pitiful condition. What was the condition like? And then secondly, the ministry of the unknown prophet from verses 7 through 10. 
something a little bit different here. Normally there's, there's sin and then there's servitude and then there's supplication. They cry out to the Lord. And then the Lord immediately raises up a deliverer. But in this instance, we have the sin, we have the servitude, we have the supplication. But before God sends a deliverer, he sends this prophet. And this prophet's going to turn the screw and he's going to say, listen, you need to own why you're in this condition. And he's, he's going to bring home the, the guilt of the people in a very, very powerful way. Very sh short message. We don't know who he is. He's, he's unknown. Uh, he doesn't say a whole lot, but in these uh, three verses, he gets right to the heart and he tells why they're in the condition they're in. And then in answer to their call for deliverance, God raises up Gideon. And so verses 11 through 40 will deal with the character and the call of Gideon, how God raised up this judge uh, to be the one who would save Israel at this time. And it's good in a sense that we're going over from chapter five to chapter six, because we've got a tremendous contrast. We, we just ended with Deborah and Barak singing and anticipating the time when all the enemies of the Lord will perish. Sadly, that period of rest that ensued after that great victory was relatively short-lived. The land had rest 40 years. And after 40 years, the triumphant strain of the song was forgotten, and a new generation arrived on the scene. And this new generation that arrived on the scene, they went back to their old ways again. Notice how it be begins, chapter 6. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Isn't it interesting how <laughs> they never seem to learn, do they? You notice that? I mean, they, this, is, this is the fourth time now that this has happened, right? We, we, so, and they, they, they know that every time they do evil in the sight of the Lord, they always end up in bondage. They always end up in difficulty. They always end up being brought low. And yet they go ahead and do it again. And there's something deceiving about sin. The Bible talks about uh, the, the deceitfulness of sin. And, and I think part of the deceitfulness of sin is that somehow we're convinced that we can do it and get away with it. Even though we know from scripture and from history, the way of the transgressor is hard. We know that it's just an established fact, but somehow we manage to persuade ourselves in our folly that we can do the same thing and get different results. We can, we can sin and it'll be okay for us. We won't be like those. And of course, it is absolute folly. So the children of Israel sadly did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. So this time with a new oppressor, it's Midian. And the name Midian, very interesting name, it means strife or brawling. You know, uh, you know, it talks about an elder, not a brawler, not somebody who's looking for a fight. Uh, well, Midian means strife or brawling. Who is this, this Midian? Well, he's a descendant of Abraham. If you look at Genesis 25, Genesis 25 in verses 1 and 2, we learn that after Sarah died, it says, obviously, when the Lord fixed Abraham, uh, he fixed him good and long term. And even after he had children uh, with Sarah, it says, uh, then again, Abraham took a wife and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimram, Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. So Midian is a descendant of Abraham, but not through Sarah. 
but through Keturah, the woman that he married afterwards. And so the Midianites are related, directly related to the Israelites. And one thing we can say is that strife is never, ever far away from the people of God. It's just a sad fact, but strife is never far away from the people of God. C.A. Coates warns believers about the danger of natural relationships. He says, nothing impoverishes more than the influence of people with whom we have something naturally in common so that one's own relatives may be a greater snare than any others. So that's a challenge, isn't it? People we're related to can become a real snare if we're not careful. Uh, hints to our development in the things of the Lord, especially if they're ones that don't know the Lord. So we find Midian, meaning strife, in God's territory and robbing his heritage. The hordes of Midian devoured the land like a plague of locusts, destroying all the fruits of the earth in a land known for its fertility. Remember, this is a land flowing with milk and honey, and yet every time it's about to produce a harvest, the Midianites come down and they basically take all. They take all the fruit. And so... <clears throat> We, we find that uh, in a very real sense, when strife comes in amongst the people of God, it has a tremendous way of devouring. Remember, Paul would say in Galatians, lest ye bite and devour one another and take it away so much blessing from the people of God. So the hordes of Midian devoured the land like a plague of locusts. Notice as well that when they came down, um, Amalek came as well. Notice verse three, it says, it was so when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the East, even they came up against them. They encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come to Gaza, left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. So now you've got Midian, which is a picture of strife and Amalek, joins in and you know well by now that Amalek is a type of the flesh right and so again just to look at it practically in terms of assembly life if you've ever been involved in assembly strife and it some of you you know what I'm talking about you've seen it happen well when that strife comes in the flesh immediately comes in as well and that's what causes such dev devastation, because whenever strife is there, Amalek shows up too, <laughs> and it really causes devastation amongst the people of God. It's interesting that uh, they uh, we often talk about weaponry, and we talked about the 900 chariots of the Canaanites that gave them an advantage. Well, the Midianites and the Amalekites also had advantageous uh, technology. Uh, they had learned how to use camels. Notice in verse 5, that they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for the multitudes, uh, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And so these, these camels, it was kind of a new dimension to warfare, increasing their ability to attack swiftly and from a distance, uh, which people say riding on asses were not able to do. And part of the reason is that, that a camel could make long journeys without the need of water. So it wouldn't need to stop, fill it up. You fill up its tanks, its humps before you set off and it's good to go. And it can go for a long time. And, and with that, and of course you get a sense of that, that if you look where Midian is uh, on, on a map, I was looking, I've got this really cool uh, set of Bible maps and Midian is down in what we call today, Saudi Arabia. And yet they came up now Ophrah, where Gideon is, 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 is way up north, north of Jerusalem. And yet this invasion comes in all the way up through the land, up to the north, and even down again to the coastal plain, down to Gaza. 
And so the idea is that they, they covered vast swathes of land, even down uh, to the southwest coast of Israel at Gaza. And so uh, these, this new type of warfare was like blitzkrieg, that the idea of traveling fast, covering huge areas of land, caused great devastation to the nation of Israel. So what, what happened to them? What, what, why were they uh, in such terrible conditions? What, what was, how was it described? Well, it's described in, in several ways. First of all, we would say that Israel lost its freedom in verses three and four. It says, when Israel had sown, the Midianites came up, the Malachites, the children of the east, even they come up against them, they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth. And, and so they're, they're, they've lost their, their freedom. And verse two, children of Israel made them dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. So, so they're, they're actually hiding in their own land for the fear of the enemy. Uh, they've lost their freedom. They've lost their fruitfulness because, as we've seen, they're already gathering up the increase of the land and they lost their food. They lost their food. And as a general principle, let me just say this. We always suffer when we're unfaithful. There's always suffering. We, we've said it. We, we want to emphasize it. We want to drive it home. The way of the transgressor is always hard. Don't let anybody tell you differently. And so there's always a consequence to unfaithfulness. And especially strife amongst God's people, it will always destroy fruitfulness. And the enemy knows that. I think the enemy knows well. His chief strategy amongst God's people is divide and conquer. See, if he can get us fighting each other, then we're not going to be worried about fighting him, right? All our energy is internal battles, strife within. And the enemy is outside laughing that we're, you know, busy fighting ourselves and he's left free uh, to pursue his evil intents. And so it, it really always destroys fruitful, fruitfulness amongst the people of God. Because all of our energy, even the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God working, instead of working through us and out, is working in us, convicting us. It's working internally, bringing us back into unity. So it's, you know, all that energy that should be blessing flowing out to others is internal, seeking to bring re reparation uh, to the damages and hurts. We also lose our freedom. There's no liberty in the meeting. Uh, for the Lord's work to be done. Uh, the spirit is grieved when there's strife coming in amongst the people of God. And one of the things that grieves the spirit is un unforgiveness. Uh, when we, we refuse to forgive our brethren. And, and so this whole scene of strife is really uh, causes devastation, lose our freedom, lose our fruitfulness. We lose our fruitfulness in the gospel, I believe because the Lord doesn't want to put new babes in such a hostile, dysfunctional environment. And so strife is a devastating thing. We even lose our appetite for food in a certain sense. Uh, when, when there's strife going on and a, a message is given, instead of taking the message to heart, you know how, what we're doing? We're thinking, I hope those brothers are listening to this message. Right. In other words, we're not getting the food. We're, we're, we're hoping it goes somewhere else, not to me, to them. I hope they're listening. And, and so we lose the food that God has for us. And all we can think about is the problems. Those that we're involved in contention with. And so it, it really robs us tremendously. When strife comes in, the beauty of Christian fellowship is marred. Longstanding friendships are broken. Saints that should be loving one another with a pure heart fervently are biting and devouring one another. You know, it, it, sadly, in our own circles, we have seen a lot of strife. And it's a very sad thing, isn't it? 
we, we love to emphasize New Testament principles, and rightly so. It's biblical. It's right there in the scriptures. But you know, one of the biggest New Testament principles is that we love one another as Christ loved us. That's a biggie. Whenever, you, Brethren, whenever you get an opportunity to teach on New Testament principles, don't miss that one. Right? That's a big one. If, I mean, it, Paul says if we have everything right and we have not love, what are we? We're nothing. And so how we need to be careful about making sure that in the midst of our adherence to truth, we hold the truth, we speak the truth in love, and we don't become hard and harsh and divisive people. You know, Philippians 2 is, I think, a great passage about this topic of strife. And we're going to kind of bear that in mind as we look at this, uh, this section on Midian and the devastation they caused. God's remedy for strife is this. He says, don't do anything through strife or vainglory, but he says this, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. In Philippians 2, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I think they, it's not, you know, you often hear preachers say, well, God works it in, you've got to work it out. That's not what he's talking about. What he's saying is the solution to strife is the humility that you find in the person of Christ. And he gives them other examples. He uses his own Paul's humility, Timothy's, Epaphras' humility, their willingness to take a lowly place to serve. And he said, this is, this is the solution, that mind of Christ, that, that, that humble mind. And he, and he says, now work it out. I'm giving you the solution. Now work it out. Work out your own deliverance as an assembly. That assembly, which was such a lovely assembly and yet was about to be torn apart because of two sisters that couldn't get on, uh, Euodi and Syntyche, they were in strife with one another, and it never, ever stays with two sisters because their Euodia has her sympathizers and Syntyche has her sympathizers. And if this doesn't get sorted out, Pretty soon, there'll be two distinct parties, and there'll be a cleavage in the meeting. And so uh, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Uh, that's pride. You know, only by pride comes contention. Vainglory is having a high opinion of yourself without due cause. And so it will turn the choicest gathering of saints into a place of bitterness and despondency, and often very quickly. So we've got to be careful about strife. And we've got to make sure that we don't do anything that's motivated by strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, like the Lord Jesus, let each esteem other better than ourselves. So this ministry of the unknown prophet now, we want to think about verses 7 through 10. And we notice in verse 7, it says, It came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites. They've become greatly impoverished, verse 6, because of the Midianites. They cry to the Lord. And it says, It came to pass when their children of Israel cried to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet. So we just need to say that, uh, again, it's, I know it's stating the obvious, but every time they get into difficulty, the only way out of that difficulty is for them to cry out to the Lord. And, and so often it's the last thing we do is pray. We try and figure it out ourselves, try and work it out ourselves. You know, we have meeting after meeting after meeting. And really the way forward is get on our knees and say, Lord, this is not right. This is not honoring to you. Would you step in? Will you bring some changes to the circumstances and the situation we're in? And so it says, when they cried to the Lord, it says the Lord, now normally the Lord just sends a deliverer, but this time, as we said, he sent a prophet to the children of Israel. We don't know who he is. And this is, we do know what he said. He says, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, brought you forth out of the house of bondage. I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And so the first thing he does is he reminds the people 
of all that God has done for them in the past. It's, a, it's really good, isn't it, to remind ourselves of all that God has done for us, how he's delivered us out of something worse than Egyptian bondage, uh, how he's brought us into a place of marvelous blessing. And, and it's so good to remind ourselves. That's why the Lord's Supper is so important, isn't it? Lest we forget Gethsemane, lest we forget thine agony, lest we forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Oh, it's good to remind ourselves of what the Lord has done for us. Yeah, it really is. And so he reminds him of what the Lord's done. And then he says this, and I said to you, I am the Lord your God, verse 10. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. And so what he's saying is, the reason that you're in the state you're in is because of your disobedience. You have not obeyed my voice. He brings sin home to their conscience. He will have the evil owned first. You know, there's a great principle in the word of God that law before gospel, conviction before conversion, wounds before healing, diagnosis before treatment, repentance before revival, right? It's always the way it is with God. And so we, we should not despise a convicting ministry that makes you feel the weight and seriousness of your sin because the Lord always wounds before he heals. He always convicts before he converts. He always diagno diagnoses the problem before he brings the remedy. And so it, we need to, you know, one of the tragedies of the, the present age is we, there's a tendency to want always nice, uh, upbuilding, make us feel good type of ministry. And, uh, and yet the word of God has much to say to us that doesn't make us feel good. It, it's the mirror. And sometimes, you know, some mornings I look in the mirror and I say, Mike, you're getting really old. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's the reality is I'm not what I was 25 years ago right? It's just reality. And the word of God is real. It's real. It shows us our true condition. It reveals to us what we're like. And we need to know what we're like. And yet we also need to know that God has a plan. God loves us. And he has a way uh, to take us for all our faults and failings and use us. And so we need that convicting work. It was a direct appeal to the conscience, challenge them as to the real reason why they found themselves in such a low physical and spiritual condition. It was the outcome of their own unfaithfulness and disobedience to the Lord and his word. It wasn't the strength of the Midianites. It wasn't the fact that they developed camels as a great weapon of warfare. And as we said in the previous one, it wasn't the 900 chariots that caused the Canaanites to dominate them. The reason that they were in that condition was because of their sinful state. And they needed to repent and be broken because of their sin. And then the Lord could step in and help them. Uh, their idolatry, their failure. And so he brings this message and he drives it home to them. And then he begins to answer their prayer by raising up a deliverer. And so we, we move on to our friend Gideon. And it says, there came an, an, an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertaineth unto Joash, the Abiezerite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So Gideon is in a place called Ophrah. Ophrah means dust. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's used uh, of fawn-like, you know, like a, a young uh, doe or deer, fawn-like. Yeah, and so it's dusty. And so I guess what we find is Gideon's right down in the dust. 
He's in the dust of despair. He, I mean, he's trying to get some food for himself and trying to hide it from the Midianites. And so we find a man in a lowly place, right down in the dust. And of course, we've said that the, the, the way to defeat strife is lowliness and humility of mind. That's the way that strife is defeated. And, and so God is going to take up a man who's right down in the dust. <laughs> he's, re- he's right down, and he's going to use him to overcome the Midianites, which speaks of tr- strife. And so <clears throat> he's, he's beating out wheat. The revised version says that he was doing it not by the wine press, but the revised version says he was doing it in the wine press, not near it, but in it. Now that, you know, the idea of, um, you know, beating the wheat is to get the, the chaff to blow away. And normally when they would thresh wheat, they would do it up on the top of a, a mountain or a high place where there's a lot of wind. And so that when they, they do the threshing, uh, the chaff will, will be blown away by the breezes of the wind. But ne- and the wine presses were actually usually lower down uh, in, the, in the valley so that you could get uh, in, uh, you know, kind of the horse and carts to take away the wine, which is heavy after it's done. So they were usually lower down. So this is not the best place to be threshing wheat. And if he's in the wine press, it's even harder. Yeah, and so, so the idea is that uh, this is, uh, again, symbolic of the condition they're in, in many different ways. Um, the fact that he's in the wine press, the wine press is intended for grapes, and it means that then there's no wine. <laughs> there's wheat in there, not wine. And it means, and of course, wine in scripture is symbolic of joy. And I want to suggest to you that when strife comes in among the saints, one of the first things that goes is joy in the meeting. Have you ever felt that heaviness when you just know that in the meeting there's that strife going on and, and the joy is not there? There's a, there's a spirit of heaviness that hangs over the place. And he's trying to get a little bit of food for himself in days of famine conditions. And that's where we find our friend Gideon. But our time is gone, and we'll have to wait till next time to see how God is going to take up this man who's down in the dust of despair, trying to feed himself. How is God going to use this man to turn the tide and defeat strife? Well, he's going to use him. And again, if we want to defeat strife, well, what's the solution? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's that humble mind, that lowliness of mind. Oh, how beautiful that is to God when we take the lowly place. And when we take a high place, that's where strife comes in. Only by pride comes contention. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.